Good morning. We're continuing with Rabbi Steif's holy book, Mitzvah Hashem, and we're in the midst of discussing the commandment. The Torah tells us not to turn our children, give our children to the idolatry of Melech. And last week, I encourage you to, uh, to listen to what we learned last week. We talked about the reasons for this commandment and how it applies in modern times. They were going to give some more details of the applicability of this commandment, this warning not to turn our children, our offspring, our, our seed into futile purposes uh, in the context of all the forbidden relationships and all the forbidden uses of procreative energy. And also the commandment is given in the context of not turning the priests into a uh, control group over the minds and the hearts of the people and not to do what um, is done by the Canaanites and by other people in the, around the world uh, that turn the priestly group into the decision makers, into the, um, into the future tellers, and into the ones that Get, the people surrender their control of their and, and their decision making and their common sense and their divine innate spiritual compass over to those priests. Um, so that's what we learned last week, and I encourage everyone to take a look at that and see how we're doing that also today, very commonly, unfortunately. So we're going to continue now in um, or on page Shin Lama Dalad, and this is page three hundred and. 34, and we are at the bottom over here in the second paragraph. He's not um, um, culpable, not punishable, until he turns over his son to Melech. We said that there were two parts to this ritual. One is actually transferring uh, his son to the priests, who would then turn around and give it back to the, the son, back to the father, for the father then to pass the child through the fire. And so there's, it's an essential part of this ritual for the culpability is to actually do the process of surrendering the child to the priests. We have Rena Baraglov, H. Der Havar. And he has to pass the child through by his feet, um, through the fire, in a way of passing through. So there has to be two components. He's not culpable uh, unless he gives over a portion of his offspring and he leaves a portion of his offspring not. Uh, given in this way. Now, this is because it says, from uh, his offspring to give. From the offspring. He does not say all his offspring. It says from his offspring, which means to say, the verse is telling us, not all his offspring, just some of his offspring. Miktsasei v'lokuloi. A portion, mixas me this, or a small amount, um, but not the whole amount. Velokule, not the whole amount. Rambam see my manis perk vav akum, chapter six of the laws of idolatry, idolatry and idolaters. Now, what's then the connection to the rest of his children? Meaning to say, we're saying. He's only culpable if he gives over some of his children and not all of his children. So are his the children that he didn't give over, are they kind of like free from the taint of this terrible, terrible act of surrendering his children to the idolatry, to the priests? And we're going to see shortly with discussion whether it's idolatry or it's just a practice or a law um, of the people that they, these priests and so forth, we're going to see that. But either way, what's with the ones that he doesn't turn over? 
So the answer is that what the priests managed to convince the gullible people is that if a person was to sacrifice or put into this process of transferring the authority over the child to the priest and then passing the child through this terrifying experience of the fire, that was going to bring good for all the children, all the person's children. Meaning to say, it's not like um, a situation where um, you're just picking one child and 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 uh, the rest of the children are not involved in this. Really, all the children are involved in this because all the children are the beneficiaries of this process. You're, the parents is actually being fooled into believing that this is something that's going to be for the benefit of all his children. I think that we also need to reflect on the point here about gullibility. And it's easy for us to laugh and say, oh, these people were so gullible, you know, to that these priests would tell them if, if you go through this process, you're going to have, you're going to procure safety and security and well-being and prosperity for your ch other children, for all your children, according to, the, including this children, if you, if you, according to the opinion that the child was not actually consumed in the fire, oh, God forbid, or um, for the, and for the rest of the children, um, for both opinions, whether the child was consumed or not consumed. Um, how, how gullible we would laugh at these parents but the fact of the matter is how gullible are we how gullible how are how are we led to believe that if we don't um surrender our authority or our thinking to a group of experts or to a cultural process or to a social process or to a ritual um that our not, all will not be well god forbid and so any time we're honest, we will see that whatever we think that these other people have as knocks against them, so to speak, we're even worse. Meaning to say, there's aspects of our lives where we should know better, but we have it in our heads that oh, this must be done otherwise. And that is the process of surrendering our well-being to the imprature of other people they will determine if we do what they set up as the as the um gate so to speak or they set up as the hurdles they have to jump through to be okay then um then we are we're being gullible now there's obviously things that we could do that we know are going to be good for our well-being and the well-being of other people around us, because we can observe that we can we can tell that um, God Almighty has given us divine guidance as to what is in our own best interest. It's not in our best interest to believe that the world has many different forces and that independent forces, which we all we have to placate all those forces, or we have to believe that everything is here by accident and and therefore um, life is a random accident. We we could see that that is not going to um lead us to the a good outcome both as individuals and and as a as a group of people as a family as a society as a civilization but what we're doing over there is we are pursuing what is right because we are we have a knowing we have a seeing of what's right we have a seeing what's wrong we have a seeing of the divine of, of what is the fabric of creation, what is the nature of creation, that creation is creation created by something beyond creation. And therefore we feel inspired and impelled and compelled to do what's in accordance with our source of life. But even there, we're not doing it in order to just merely placate. We're doing it because this is what we are called to do as created beings. This is what we're just like we breathe because this is the living force of all living things is to to bring more life and to increase life so too we're going to um do this 
the, the commandments because that's going to bring us more life. Just like we're not going to um, try to violate the laws of gravity. We're not going to violate what God Almighty is conveying to us. This is for our own good. But the difference is that we can see that we can see that God Almighty is bringing out the greatest honor of us. He is bringing out the divine in us. He is. He wants us to. He wants to bring us out to bring out of us the reflection of God Almighty that's within us. He wants to honor our unique contribution. He wants to honor our our insights, our unique insights. When I say, I was going to think of the word independent. It's not that we're independent because we are, we are recognizing that our divine wisdom is coming from God Almighty. So it's not independence, but it's uniqueness. It's not groupthink at all. It's the opposite of groupthink. We're actually each uniquely gifted with a unique expression of the divine image. And therefore, we're each able to bring to the forefront a unique expression of, of insights that are what we could see and what we could hear and what we could explain. And also unique expressions of love, compassion, and restraint and endurance and splendor and and creating foundation and, and nobility each one of us is a completely unique expression of those all those aspects unique way of speaking unique way of acting of bringing glory to god almighty into the world of bringing benefit to every single human being into the world so god almighty is actually enhancing the uniqueness in us and in and showing that each one of us is meant to bring to the forefront this divine power in a completely unique way that's honoring our uniqueness eight billion times over and then when the popular world population will be 80 billion it's going to be 80 billion unique and indispensable expressions of the divine image in the world and, and so on and so forth as the world population multiplies exponentially The contrast is the concept of melech, where a person is being gullibly led to believe that his well-being is dependent on surrendering that uniqueness, surrendering that, uh, that, that divine gift, that divine power to other human beings. Other human beings hold the key to his wellness. Other human beings hold the key to his expression. Other human beings hold the, who, who have some sort of secret or, um, they're the ones that have the unique or secret or, or uh, special information and special insight and special status that without them, you can't even, you can't get there. You can't have it. You can't, you can't be it. You can't have the well-being. So you're going to ask yourself the obvious question. One second here. Don't we say that there we have in the, in the Torah, we have um, a, uh, priests, we have Kehanim, we have Levim, we have the tribe of Levi, and then the Jewish people as a whole are meant to be the Kehanim, meant to be the priests for the entire world? And the answer is, this is a special responsibility, it's a special stewardship, it's not anyone surrendering their power. In fact, it talks about how Mashiach while he's going to be a king of the Jewish people, he's not going to, he's going to be more of a, a, rather than a king of the entire world, he's going to be more of a wise advisor for the entire world. Every human being is going to have his own unique contribution, his own unique insights. As a matter of fact, the extreme to which the Torah teaches that every human being has access to what's true and what's divine is as we learned before with Rabbi Shtaif that why is every human being responsible for keeping the divine commandments? And he's responsible for the consequences of his not keeping the divine commandments. When maybe he didn't learn about the divine commandments. Maybe he didn't 
have the opportunity to learn Torah and, and no one was accessible to him or none of the teachings of Torah were accessible to him. How is it that he is obligated and, and culpable for the commandments not to murder and not to be idolatrous and not to be immoral and to theft and so forth? That was Steph explained because every human being has the ability and the as access to the divine wisdom by reflecting on the way that God Almighty has created the world and to intuit as to what the truth is of existence and beyond existence. That every human being has access to that. Even if they never heard of the Torah, they would themselves come to the conclusion of what is true and they would conduct themselves accordingly. So even though the Torah is given on Mount Sinai through Moses, our teacher, and it's the responsibility of the Jewish people to teach that to the entire world. And the, the, the portions that apply to the entire world, the Torah was given in 70 languages and Moses, our teacher wrote it in 70 languages. And the Jewish will have this responsibility of stewardship. It's still not saying that the Jewish will have a monopoly on this divine wisdom, because the divine wisdom is accessible to every human being. Even a person who lives in a place of the world who didn't ever meet a Jew and didn't ever hear a teaching from, a Torah, from the Torah or didn't ever see a printing of the Torah is going to have to, is, has the ability and the ability to, to understand this divine wisdom from himself, from his own observations. And this responsibility is so obvious and so accessible and so easy for a human being to access that he's responsible for all his actions because it's presumed that he will come to this, to this conclusion because we have a principle which we're actually gonna discuss over here and what we're learning is that you can't, person can't be punished for that which he's not warned about. So God Almighty doesn't punish people for things that they didn't know they weren't supposed to do. So how could you, a, a human being who never learned Torah, how could he be punished for uh, doing something improper, let's say for murder? No one ever told him not to murder. No, he is meant to know that he's not supposed to murder from his own divine wisdom that is guiding him in his own spiritual compass that he has access to. And it's, he has such access to it. And it's so self-evident that he's, meant to have that, that he is considered warned. He knows what the right answer is. He knows what the truth is. So there's no status of monopoly on divine insight in the Torah. Even to the extent that we say that there's wisdom by the nations, and we could believe that there's wisdom by the nations, but there's uh, this Torah is only found by the Jewish people. That it means to say that the Torah from Lashon Hira, from the that that the consequence of the divine insights brings about the requirement of the details of the commandments, and particularly the commandments that are given in a way that would not um, be intuited. So all the commandments we saying that are uh, the seven commandments and all their details. Those are something that a human being would be able to understand and grasp and have the insight to himself. But let's say commandments that are Bosh and Heira, instruction, that um, the depth of them and the, and the details of them, that's something that's in the Torah. And that's something that the Jewish people have a responsibility to steward that for the entire world. But that stewardship is all about bringing out to the forefront divine image in every single human being, bringing out the uniqueness and the greatness of every human being. Whereas Melech is about subjugating a human being and saying, you can't have access to what's good for you and good for your family unless you put these priests as the power source above you, as the ones with the access above you. And you have to go through a ritual of surrendering your child to that authority in order for there to be well-being. And it's so interesting if, 
and so important to spend this time talking about this because we can see such a stark contrast with the Torah. Because you're going to say to yourself, well, one second, don't we also send, even when we're going to, uh, we dedicate our children to the service of God Almighty, we send our children to a cheder, to a, a room where they study Torah, a yeshiva, a place of sitting and, and knowing God Almighty and, and studying the Torah, learning the Torah. Isn't the parent sending his child to the um, rabbi to learn Torah? Isn't he turning his child over? And the answer is no. That's not what the Torah is teaching us. The Torah is teaching us that the parent is the ultimate and really the sole authority as to the dedication of his child into the service of God Almighty. In order for the parent to best be able to fulfill that, he, because the parent is, has to has obligations, let's say, to make a living and to, not the, God Almighty is making a living, but the parent has, is going to um, do a business or a trade and, and um, bring to the table food so he doesn't have 12 hours a day or eight hours a day to spend on the um, Torah learning for himself or for his child. And so therefore he hires a Rebbe, a teacher to teach his son. So this, the Rebbe is actually working at the behest and is subjugated to the authority of the parent. And it's the parent's responsibility to supervise and to scrutinize every detail of what the teacher is teaching, every detail of every material that the child is exposed to, every book and magazine that's coming into the house, everything that the child is reading in the school is, 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 is being told to read in the schools, and to say, no, this is not acceptable, take their child out, reject the material. So Tara is telling us that the parent has the absolute responsibility. And the school is only a tool in the parent's toolbox to accomplish what the parent is meant to accomplish. There is no surrendering your child to the authority of the school system. There is no threatening your authority of your, over your child to the teacher. So that's what we could see when we look in detail how different the Torah perspective is, the Torah approach, the Torah living is than Melech. And we have to ask ourselves the question, to what degree are we gullibly and immaturely abdicating our responsibility when we send our kids even to the most Torah observant schools and in our mind we're making a decision that we're surrendering our child to the authority to the to the greater knowledge of the teachers to the greater expertise of the teachers and we are um, allowing that transference of authority which is exactly what happened uh, with Melech so these are all sobering thoughts and this is why like I said we have to spend the time not to just laugh off these people who signed up for Melech but to really really understand that the Torah is telling us it's an eternal commandment don't do this then there's something I need to learn right now about what I am doing and what I'm supposed to be doing and what I need to be doing better. So return, to return over here, <clears throat> to what Rabbi Steif is bringing over here, the concept of 
turning over a portion of the children and not all the children, although as we said, all the children are part of the process because they're all the intended beneficiaries of this sacrifice of, of one or a few of the children. The Casa of the Smag, in the square brackets down here, and it's written by the Smag, the Sefer Mitzvah Sekhtayu. There's an answer. There's a reason for this. <clears throat> As an answer to those that are denying God Almighty, denying the Torah, because the op obvious question you would have is, how? what does this mean that a person is not obligated if he sacrifices only one or a few of his children, a portion of his children to Melech, he's culpable. It's a, it's a capital crime. But if he sacrifices all the children to Melech, there's no, he's not punished. <clears throat> so, seems to be something off over here. That's who, that's fodder for the ones that want to try to attack the Torah. Say, how, how does that make sense? So the answer is Shabimesis. Right here at the end of this. I'm going to go to the next page. One second here. Keep you in suspense while we add this page. Shabimesis based in with the top of this page over here, the top of 335. By the at the death by the hands of a court of law, a human court of law. Mishaprim homosin are atoned the those that die, the executed ones. They they receive an atonement. The process of um being executed is a process of atonement. Vizeh and this one, the one who sacrificed all his children, asakolkachavera. He did such a transgression, Gadila, such a great, great transgression against God Almighty and against other human beings. That God Almighty, does, the Holy One, blessed be He, does not want that this person should have any atonement. His, his transgression is so great that He doesn't even get the benefit of being executed. So that's why a person who sacrifices all his children is not executed because his it the, the crime is so beyond any measure of of uh it's so so terrible that he there's no atonement for him and therefore he doesn't even merit to be executed now we're going to discuss the question is this idolatry casa yerim similar race i and aleph we have an understanding that Melech is not idolatry. Now, we're going to see that there's two different opinions over here. There's an opinion that is idolatry. Outright idolatry. There's an opinion, you're going to see that there's an opinion that it's not idolatry. It's a practice, but not particularly in the service of an idol. And then there's, we're going to see Rabbi Steifer says, well, it's even if it's not idolatry, it's, it's connected to idolatry, and therefore it is also forbidden from that perspective. Now, the interesting thing is, on one hand, we would say, one second, this is obviously an idolatrous practice. What are we going to learn from saying it's not idolatry? And I think that it actually, in Exploring this opinion that it's not idolatry, it actually enhances and strengthens the relevance to us. Because we, as Torah observant Jews and Torah observant non Jews, are convinced, and it could be right, that we don't participate in any form of idolatry. And we eradicate any, any form of idolatry. We don't want to have anything to do with idolatry and willing to give up our lives not to be involved in idolatry. 
So when we hear about Melech, an idolatry, one say, I'm not an idolater. I don't have anything to do with these practices. So if we're to say this, no, it never was idolatry. It's forbidden because the Torah forbids it. It's a, it's a repugnant act, and therefore it's forbidden. Then we can't use the cloak of our general non idolatrous life to say, oh, I don't do any idolatry, so this doesn't apply to me. No, this is, was not idolatry. Don't think about it. Oh, it's in cover, included in the prohibitions of idolatry. And therefore, since I'm not an idolater and I, you know, say, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one every day, and I pray and I do the commandments, whether person's doing the commandments at, at the 613 commandments or the seven commandments and all their hundreds and details. Um, and none of the, and, and the person's complete um, avoidance of any idolatry. No, here we're coming and saying, don't fool yourself into thinking that you, because you're not an idolater, that therefore you don't have anything to do with this. This is, wasn't an idolatry in the first place. It was a practice, a way people interacted with the priest. It's the way that people interacted with, had a practice of surrendering their children and believing that their well-being was dependent on going through a particular ritual. And this you have an obligation to stay away from and not do. So you have to look at this independently and examine to make sure you're not doing any any aspects of this. Um, you have to do it independently of any uh, life decisions and, and uh, moment by moment uh, avoidance of idolatry you're doing. This is a separate um, aspect of your practice and your thinking and your speech and your actions that you need to evaluate. So on the contrary, taking it out of the general category of idolatry makes it even more relevant and requiring our examination, requiring our clear and honest assessment of am I involved in any way, in any aspect of this. So according to this opinion, this is not idolatry. And rather, it's a, a decree, it's a practice of the people of those times. And as we're saying, it's we have to look and see that it's a practice today also. It may have a different name, but it's really the same practice. Um, it's, it's a practice. And the Torah said this practice, this, this way of doing things, of transferring children over to the power of the priests and then passing them to the fire is the Torah is particular about this and says, this is culpable. <clears throat> this is culpable. Um, prison is culpable uh, for doing this terrible transgression with the death penalty by stoning. And they're all automatically, <clears throat> or as a consequence, Dafka, he said, therefore, Someone who specifically, if someone does this for this priest, these priestly beliefs of Melech, that's specifically when he is culpable. Avadashar Akum. But if a person does it to other um, idolatries, then he's not obligated because that is not the way of serving those other idolatries. Meaning to say that we have a general principle that um, you're, there's certain types of there's certain types of um, idolatrous practice that are forbidden, no matter. Uh, in, in any ideology. So for example, bowing down, a person cannot bat, prostrate themselves to any type of idolatry, even if this that's not the service of a particular idolatry. There's another type of forbidden activity where you can't do the thing that is forbidden, is the practice of that particular idolatry. So let's say you have an idolatry uh, that in addition to bowing down or instead of bowing down, that everyone has to um, do a particular thing. They have to, you know, uh, wiggle their toes, let's say, 
well, then it's forbidden to wiggle your toes to that idolatry because that's part of the practice of that idolatry. But if you go to idolatry where the only service is, let's say, bowing down and you wiggle your toes, that's not uh, a forbidden act of idolatry because that idol doesn't have wiggling your toes as a um, idolatrous action. And that's not part of the service of that idolatry. So it's not, and you're not practicing idolatry when you wiggle your toes at an idol that doesn't uh, have that as a type of service. So it would come out, therefore, that if a person, since uh, uh, other idolatries don't have this practice of turning over the child and passing them through fire, if a person was to do that for other idolatries, uh, it's not going to be considered idolatry because it's not part of the service of that idol. So that would be one outcome of this distinction of whether or not it is a um, idolatrous practice or not. If it's just a, uh, and when I say just, it's not that it's any less significant because the Torah is telling us it's a, it's a, uh, it's a capital crime to do this. But if it's not an idolatrous practice, it's a forbidden practice. It's a forbidden um, way of doing things that these um, priests and these people were involved in, um, then it's not going to apply to other idolatries because it's not an idolatrous practice. But there's another distinction. The question is, how does this apply then to uh, children of Noah for non-Jews that do this? Is he culpable or not? Because we know that anything that's idolatry is forbidden to non-Jews. But if it's not idolatry, um, it's it's a forbidden practice. The question is, does this forbiddenness apply to a non-Jew or not? If it's not an idolatry, but rather it's forbidden for the reason that in their ways, in the in the practices of the um, uh, of the residents of Canaan, you're, we should not go. Even though the Torah is more stringent um, in this particular uh, practice of this um, transferring the children over to Melech, more than the other practices of the Canaanites, the Anshu Alea Karis Skila, and they are the Torah is declaring a punishment of spiritual excision for a person who did not meet the requirements for the warning and so forth, and the witnesses that are necessary to execute the stoning. So therefore, that person receives spiritual excision, and the person who is witnessed uh, warned and has witnesses to his transgression, he is stoned uh, by a human court. Nevertheless, so even though it's it's a, a particularly highlighted as that's forbidden, and it is um, something that is um, it's it's particularly highlighted. It's going to turn off those uh, bells. Even though it's particularly highlighted as um, as a as a as a crime as a transgression that's highlighted and, and uh, emphasized from all the other possible practices of the Canaanites as something that's particularly uh, deserving of of uh, being forbidden and and uh, and punished. Um, nevertheless, that wouldn't. But automatically fall upon non-Jews as a, as a prohibition. But if we're going to say that it's a uh, it's a practice, a, a law of from the laws of the of idolatry, then it's included in the service of idolatry, and therefore it's. Uh, the Imkain, therefore, So therefore, a non-Jew that's going to do this to sacrifice his child to Melech is, is obligated for the reason that it's idolatry. And another point is that from the um from the verse that says, and don't give 
from your seed, from your offspring, it seems to be proving Muchach the Kayal Rakal Yisrael seems to be that it's referring just to uh, the Jewish people. It says your offspring. And what it says uh, close by. Don't disgrace the name of the Lord your God. And we learn that only a Jewish person is warned not to desecrate the name of God Almighty. Like it's explained in Sanhedrin in the Talmud 75 on the page 75 on the first side. So we're grappling with this question does it what's the context what's the what's the context of this commandment is this commandment uh referring to avoid idolatry and is it and if it is idolatry then it applies to the non-jews but if it's um not idolatry then maybe it doesn't apply to non-jews and if if it's not doesn't apply uh if it's not idolatry then what other source what other things do we look at to see whether it applies to the non-jew or not well it seems to be in a verse that's uh, referring to um, your seed, your offspring, and this is a, a, a the instructions to Jewish people, and um, and it says Dabeo b'nei Israel, and also says don't desecrate the name of God, which seems to be an a a, a uh, commandment that is a obligatory on the Jewish people. So. It's interesting that if you look into the into the, um, the verse of the beginning, we, we said we we'll always look at the context. Rabbi Steif doesn't bring this point over here. But if we take a moment here, we're going to pull up. Um, pull up the verse. Leviticus, Vaikra, chapter 18. So, take a look at this over here. So it says... We we we're here in verse twenty one, and from your offspring, lo siten lahavi lemelech velo techalal eshem elkech ani eshem. From your seed, which could mean, uh, we're saying, does that just mean to you, for you, the one who's being told this commandment, meaning a Jewish person? And also this, and don't desecrate the name of profane the name of the Lord your God. I am the I, I, I am the Lord, God Almighty. And if that only applies to a non-Jew, so maybe this whole verse is only apply only that, that applies only to a Jew. So maybe this whole verse only applies to to a Jew. But it's very interesting that it says over here. They go to the beginning. Beginning of the parsha says, "Vaidaber uh, Hashem el Moishalim," and the Lord God Almighty said to Moses, saying, "Daber b'nei Yisrael, speak to the Jewish people, and say to them, I am the Lord God Almighty, your God." And then it says, "Don't do like the practices of the Egyptians and the practice of the don't do like the practices of the Canaanites. Follow my." ordinances and observe my statutes and I'm the Lord your God. And then it says in verse 5, And guard my commands and my laws that a man will do them and he'll live in them. And then it continues to say a bunch of commandments that you should know that you might be giving up certain physical experiences in this world, all these forbidden relationships, but you're going to live spiritually by and have a and your spiritual life is going to be 
alive because you're going to reject these physical experiences. So don't think that you're losing out because you're really gaining by rejecting these physical experiences. But in the Talmud, where it says, Rabbi, it says that a non-Jew who learns Torah, according to Rabbi Meir, is like the Kayan Gadol. He's like the high priest. His source is this verse over here, verse 5. He says, A guard my decrees and my laws, that by doing them, <clears throat> the man will live with them, for I am the Lord God Almighty. So the mayor says this, it says the Adam, it doesn't say specifically a Jewish person. It says that this is referring to every human being. Learning Torah is, is, is bringing life to himself and he's therefore considered like a high priest. So it's what's fascinating is that even though the verse in verse two is saying, speak to the Jewish people, there is clearly our mayor is saying that we see learn out from verse five that is applying to every human being. So that's something for us to consider in this discussion. If we're going to look at the verses over here, now, so Rabbi Steif doesn't bring this point that I'm bringing about what Rabbi Mayer is learning out from verse five, verse hey, I was like, hey, um, but just something for you to consider and to see the whole context over here that even though. A verse is saying, speak to the Jewish people. There are great Torah scholars, Rabbi Meir, who is learning out that it actually, one of those verses that was said, it says explicitly say to the Jewish people. Yeah, one of those verses is clearly referring to every human being. Um, so something of uh, interest in your comments and you can uh, you know, bring up questions now or you could send email. Uh, post in the comments when this is posted up on online, but just something to consider that point. Now, um, we're going to continue next week with the rest of uh, the third paragraph and the rest of this chapter. Um, for those that are coming in now from Germany, uh, we forgot to announce that um, th th we changed the clocks this morning. And so now it's 7 a.m. Uh, here is uh, really 12 p.m., 12 noon, your time in Germany, and not the usual 1 o'clock. So I see, thank God, a, a bunch of you jumped on at 8 o'clock our time. But that's now um, at, at 8 o'clock, 1 o'clock your time, which is now 8 o'clock. Uh, yeah. And we, we did this we did this last time. We... we uh, kind of caught us uh, doesn't catch us by surprise we know what this change in the clock but this this different speech for uh for for um the people in germany so hopefully we'll have this video up soon and you'll have a chance to watch it um and then so if, i think you're starting someone mentioned when you're changing the clocks i think it's later on in um in uh, march so for the next few weeks we're going to be learning at 12 o'clock german time and then um yeah can you remind us what day the changing the clocks in germany please it's uh march 26th and that's a sunday also yes two weeks from now okay so so today is the 12th today was at 12 noon german time uh, the 19th is going to be 12. That next week is going to be 12 noon German time. And then the 26th, you're changing the clocks in Germany. So then it'll be back to one o'clock. So just, it's going to be only one more week of 12 o'clock Germany time. And um, I hope I, I remember to make that on the current notice. I'm sorry about the, the uh, not knowing what's in advance. And I see also, I guess, London. What what's the time in London now? Is it is it uh, now four hours? What is it now? Twelve o'clock and I can't hear you. 
Sorry, our, our time also changes on 26. Now oh, it's okay. quarter past 12, so it's just similar to Germany. Ah, but you're one, you're one hour. So, so, now, uh, so now you're only four hours different than us. And uh, okay, so next week, then it's going to be at 11 o'clock London time, 12 o'clock Germany time, and then the week out 26 will be 12 o'clock um, time and 1 o'clock German time. Okay. All right. Can I ask one thing about um, identity of whom Hashem addressing through Moses? Yes. Um, um, if I remember it correctly, at uh, Mount Sinai, um, when God first spoke, it, I think the word was Ha'am, which was included the Erev Rab, who came out with children of Israel. Uh, uh, and the question is whether they are all decimated after the golden calf incident or not. Uh, we don't know. But um, these Erev Rav does not appear um, in, in the Torah at all after the Mount Sinai. I mean, I, th I think it's only come out at the um, Exodus 12. So were they included in? the children of Israel, even though it, in the um, plain language it says B'nai Israel, it, is it equal to Ha'am? And this Ha'am embodies with um, those, you know, people came out from Egypt. So uh, which verse are you referring to uh, that's saying here... You're talking about um, chapter, what, chapter 19? Wait, so show it, me which. It's, um, I think it's in Mishpatim. Um, or or y Yitro? Yeah, in Yitro is the Ten Commandments. Because if you say... If you're looking in verse chapter 20, verse 1, says Vaidabe Alakim as is called Devaim Lemur, and that then starts the Ten Commandments. Okay, so um if you go back up a little bit. Okay. Um, uh, chapter 19, verse 9. Is it 9? Tet? So Ishma Ham Badaberi Imaka. So which which verse are you on? Uh, verse nine on chapter nineteen. Uh, I'll read it in English. Hashem said to Moses, Behold, I come to you in the thicket of the cloud, so that the people will hear I speak to you. So that's Ha'am. <clears throat> And then verse 10, Hashem said to Moses, go to the people and uh, sanctify them today. Mm -hmm. and again, that's Ha'am. And verse 11, let them be uh, prepared for the third day. Um, Hashem shall descend in the sight of the entire people on Mount Sinai. So that's Ha'am. Um, And in fact, those who said "Na'asev Nishma," I think I need to look into the um, actual verse, but I think it was Ha'am. So is that um, purely Brunei Israel, or does it include um, Erev Rab? Well, I'll give you a simple resolution of all this, which is that the Ten Commandments. Um, one second. The Ten Commandments here. The Ten Commandments were given in actually in all seventy languages. That the entire world is supposed to hear the Ten Commandments. So we we have to realize that, and the we have to realize that. Just one second. Let me turn off these notifications because it's. Easy. Um, I don't know if you heard the dinging, but there's something distracting over here. Um, 
the Ten Commandments were given in a context that the entire world was supposed to hear them. In fact, the the um, Turim points out that there's 620 letters in the Ten Commandments, and that is referring to the 613 commandments that apply to the Jewish people and the seven general categories of commandments that apply to the entire humanity. That's included, that's 600, that's 613 plus seven is 620. And the, the Talmud in, in, uh, in the tractate of Shabbos says that the, ter, the God Almighty's words were split into 70 languages simultaneously. Every utterance was split into 70 languages. So uh, clearly every human being is covered by it. There's no, there's no distinction. Only distinction that comes up in in the ten command. In fact, if you we if you go back to the original classes that we learned, um, in Rabbi Steif Sefer, he talks about how um, Shem, the son of Noah, was teaching the Sheva Mitzvahs with a different formulation of the seven general commandments, which included others from the ten commandments. So, for example, not to covet. As one of the seven commandments. The, the only one where we get into a question, and we know that the, the laws to honor your mother and father apply to the non-Jews. Only one that comes is, is you're gonna now we can have a discussion of what is the nature of the commandment of Shabbos, how does it apply to the non-Jews? So the first of the Ten Commandments, the first time of the iteration of the Ten Commandments actually says Zohar Shema Shabbos, which to remember the Shabbos day, which is something that applies to every human being, has to know that God Almighty. Or, uh, created the world in six days and rested on the seventh. The second iteration of the Ten Commandments, which is on, which is in Parshas Vayes Hanan, in the book of Deuteronomy, says, Shomer is Yom HaShavuz, guard the Shabbos day. And because that was given in a quiet way, not in the presence of the entire world, that applies only to the Jewish people. So, but it says that in the first Ten Commandments, even Shomer and Zohar were said, the Dibur Echad, meaning to say, God Almighty, the word came out as uh, remember and guard at the same time. So the remembrance part applies to the entire humanity, and the guarding part is something that's a specific responsibility of the Jewish people to not just remember, but to refrain from any type of um, activity uh, of, of the 39 forbidden labors as a testimony to the entire world that this is, that God Almighty created the world in six days and rested on the seven. So the point I'm bringing out over here is that this the, the Ten Commandments is applying to the entire world. So of course the heir of Rob was included in it. If we apply that um, later on after Mishkan is built and Leviticus, Moses goes on, all these um, other additional laws, can we say that is, of course, it's included, um, you know, nations are included to, to keep these commandments? Which commandments? Oh, the, the ones we just looked at. Um, Leviticus 18, 21. Oh, so, well, that that's, that's, then now comes a question. You have to look at each verse and say, well, is this a specific, for example, if there's, there's a commandment to build a temple. So the commandment to build the temple is something that is a specific responsibility for the Jewish people to build the temple on behalf of the entire world. The non-Jews should support it and and and, uh, and help enable that to happen as we see that in times of King Solomon, that the king of uh, Hiram and so forth, and Lebanon and so forth, was, was very instrumental in helping build the holy temple. So... It's something that's a benefit to the entire world and that the whole world should participate in it. But the responsibility, the commandment applies to the Jewish people. Whereas there's some things that are going to apply to the entire world. So the question is, what applies to the entire world and what doesn't apply to the entire world? So, so the, the, the reason, so, so each one has to be looked on in its own, its own merit, so to speak. Its own, you have to examine each one separately. So what is, if, if you really understand the whole process of here, think of it as the, the whole world has is created in the God Almighty's divine image. And everyone has a 
absolutely responsibly to know there's nothing besides God Almighty and to act accordingly. Now, there's a, there's a cer certain spiritual sensitivity that was transmitted from Adam to Chase to, <clears throat> to, um, to shame, Noah, shame, Aver. And this is this spiritual, this awareness of that, their, the obligation to um, certain responsibility towards the Holy Land, certain responsibility towards the rest of humanity, uh, a spiritual sensitivity. So, for example, the laws of, of, of ritual purity, that's something that Abraham and his family took those on. Those are already known from beforehand. But Abraham and his family took those on, and the Jewish people took those on. So we have commandments that apply to ritual purity. We have commandments that apply to separating the produce of the land. We have commandments. Those, but those are commandments that are resulting from a higher level of spiritual sensitivity. And the higher the person's level of spiritual sensitivity, the more responsibility they have in these type of, of areas. So, for example, um. A priest among the Jewish people can has to be in a heightened sense of of spiritual responsibility and spiritual sensitivity, and he has can only eat the the foods that are tied to him and the, when he's spiritually pure. But those that's those stringencies and of, of when when you could eat what and what you could eat don't apply to the average Jewish person. So what is and then the high priest has heightened spiritual sensitivity over all the rest of the priests and he has certain obligations and as to who he can marry and his uh, preparation for the service of the um for serving in the temple on the on yom kippur and stuff like that because he's bringing atonement to the entire world so so you would say so everything in the torah we have to look at it and say is this meant for every human being, or is this something that is a specific command for the high priest? So you can't, if that says to the high priest that he has to marry, can't marry a certain person, or it says to the, that the priest in general cannot marry a woman who's a divorcee. Um, so that's, that's you, you can't learn from that and say, oh, well, every, every human being shouldn't marry a divorcee. Because why not? If it's good enough for the priest, it's, 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 if it's, it should be good enough for everyone else. No one should marry a divorcee. But no, we have to understand what's the context of the command over here. It's because there's a heightened spiritual responsibility, heightened spiritual awareness of the of the kahanim. Therefore, this is something that God Almighty says, don't marry a divorcee. But the rest of humanity is perfectly, including the Jewish people and including all the other human beings, are, are able to marry a divorcee. There's no prohibition on that. So, so you have to look at each verse, and, and that's what the the a large part of what the discussion in the Talmud is: what is the what is the applicability of this verse? If you, for example, does a verse apply to women? Are women bound by a particular command? So it's not just about Jews and non-Jews. It's about does it apply to the priests? Does it apply to the non-priests? Does it apply in the Holy Land? Does it not apply in the? Does it apply mm -hmm. outside the Holy Land? Does it apply in the only in the times of the Temple? Does it apply in all times? Does it apply to men and women or just to men? These are all questions about every single commandment is to understand who's covered by it, where they, where is this apply, when does it apply? And that gives us the, where our job is to investigate that and know what applies to each one of us. And so we, there's no blanket statement as to which commands apply and we have to look into each one to understand what is what's God Almighty's intention. Thank you very much. It explains very well. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay. Well, God bless you all. And so happy to have you here and happy to learn together with you. And we'll continue, God willing, next week. As we said, it'll be 7 o'clock U.S. time, 12 o'clock. Uh, at 11 o'clock London time and 12 o'clock German time on uh, March the 19th. And then we'll be returning to 7 a.m. U.S. time, 12 p.m. London time and 1 p.m. German time on March the 26th. Okay. Thank you all for being here. And this, uh, for the beginning of the video, hopefully this will be posted soon and you'll get to be able to watch what we learned at the beginning. Some important lessons about making sure, further insights into making sure that we're not 
involved in the practices of Melech, how we could uh, make sure that we're not. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.